that the uh, title of this panel is the Mises Institute as an Intellectual Home. And I think one of the themes that's been going on the last couple of days is the recognition that ideas and institutions are only as good as the people that make them up. And I know one of the great honors that I've had now, uh, I've been with the Mises Institute now since 2015, there's nothing that inspires me more than actually getting to know the students coming through these programs. And so before I ask our panel how they came to uh, find themselves at Mises U, we've got a very special video for you guys to give you a little taste of uh, what makes the best week of the year just so special. My first Mises U would have been 1995 when I came here to grad school at Auburn. Right now, we're feeling like we're under attack for espousing an idea of a free market when it seems like Marxism is on the ascendancy uh, again. But I know that there's kind of a home base here where I can get together and we can actually talk about Austrian economics to reinforce the fact that we're not always by ourselves. One of the great things about uh, Mises University is that you get the full picture. You get all of Austrian economics in, in one go. And uh, for many students, it's like a springboard into uh, a, a lifetime of freedom in Austrian economics. It's fascinating. It's fun. It uh, stimulates them to study Austrian economics, typically for the rest of their lives. One student at Mises University can turn into 100 people learning about Mises and learning about Rothbard. Mises and Rothbard are no longer with us, but the ideas that they had are still fresh. I think that the publishing agenda that the Institute has can be really powerful. Sometimes it's because somebody picked up one book. You know, 20 years later, that person shows up and says, you know, you made a really big difference with this book because you gave me an idea that countered some of the things that I was struggling with at that time. Or how many minds have been changed because of that? Probably the, the biggest influence for me would be the summer fellowships teaching Austrian economics. I've seen all of these brilliant scholars give lectures over the years, and, and so now I have, I have something that I can look back on teaching my students. I think what I've enjoyed most about the Institute is that we get to come together as a group of undergrad or um, graduate students and we all believe in similar ideas um, and it's really cool to kind of have this community. The Mises graduate program offers a Master of Arts degree in Austrian economics and it's the only purely 100% Austrian master's program that I know of. Well, I enrolled because my future plan is to pursue a PhD and teach Austrian economics. And it's really only due to the generous contributions of donors that uh, this program is accessible and, and affordable for lots and lots of students, myself included. It, it really is inspiring to see what's happening with these students, and I think that's ultimately the impact that the Mises Institute is having, to be able to take those ideas to a generation that is being confronted with Marxism almost every time they pick up their cell phone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sponsoring me. Thank you for supporting the Mises Institute. And just a, a little taste of what I like to call libertarian Hogwarts. Um, <laughs> so as Sandy mentioned, giving some background on our panelists, uh, we got a lot of uh, different backgrounds, a lot of different interests. And so starting off, I just want to ask all of you, how did you come to the Mises Institute and what attracted you to Mises University in the first place? Uh, we'll start with you, Connor. So I was a freshman in undergrad and my economics professor, luckily enough, I know not everybody gets this at a university, but my economics professor assigned me Henry Hazlitt's Econ in One Lesson, and it was the greatest book I'd ever read. At the same time, my fraternity big brother kept telling me about this guy, Dr. Ron Paul, and showing me all these clips. And I had never heard any of this stuff, but I dove in. I ended up, when I graduated, working for the Florida House of Representatives, and my boss had told me to kind of keep this side a little more on the down low. 
And uh, eventually, I gave up on that and left the Florida House of Representatives. And the day that I had turned in my resignation, I went straight to Mises.org and filled out my Mises U application. And I've been to almost every Mises event I have been able to go to since. Annika? Um, I didn't have a lot of experience with the Mises Institute before going to Mises University. But my mother and my aunt and my grandmother all had a lot of experience with it. So they pretty much told me I had to go. And I'm glad they did. <laughs> It was a really good experience, and I'm, I'm glad I went. So my freshman year of high school, I interviewed Walter Block on my podcast. And you know we had a great interview, and he told me afterwards, you know, hey, COVID is starting to cool down, and these events are starting up at full admission again, so you should check out AERC. And so I ended up applying, and I, I sat on it for a while, and I submitted it like a few weeks before AERC. And I got a phone call like a week later, and all I heard was, hey, this is Felicia. And I was like, oh, damn, it's a prank call. Um, but no, it was actually, it was, um, it was the Mises Institute. And I got the opportunity to go to AERC. And then from that, I went to practically every event possible. I've gone to two Mises U's since then, uh, the last two supporter summits and the last two AERCs. And I'm just so thankful to even receive the opportunity in the first place. Uh, so. My interaction with Mises U was somewhat serendipitous. I was uh, attending a seminar at the, uh, with the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. Um, I'm a Coolidge scholar, which means that the foundation uh, pays for my tuition and, and my room and board, which I'm very grateful for. And they gather for us every summer a great uh, group of speakers. And uh, one of them, who's also on the board, I'm not I know he was here, but uh, Robert Luddy, uh, we were talking and I wanted advice on entrepreneurship. I wasn't even looking for economics advice, so I asked him, because I am very entrepreneurial, want to continue that. So I asked him over an email, could I get some advice on entrepreneurship? He uh, runs Captive Air Systems, which is kind of the uh, gold standard of ventilation systems. And he sent me a ton of books unprompted and presentations, and among them were this gigantic book like the size of my head that's Hols Holzman's Biography of Mises and Bastiat's The Law. I've never heard of these guys before. And I read The Law, um, and I go on Mises.org, I subscribe to them, and then I get an email you know, right before the deadline that that, uh, or I think the deadline might have already passed, uh, saying apply to Mises U, so I, I did, and I found myself there, not even really at the time being a libertarian or uh, an Austrian economist. So uh, we've heard already from uh, people like Peter Klein and Joe Salerno kind of uh, great memories with Murray Rothbard. And we, we haven't quite perfected the Rothbard hologram yet, um, but can you just share some moments that really stand out about your time at Mises U? If it's a David Gordon joke, maybe not share that one. Um, you know, Mitchell, can we start with you? Sure. So uh, yesterday in, in Jim Grant's talk, he mentioned how we need a Department of Common Sense, right? Um, so if there were one, it would be composed mostly of Mises U speakers and alums. And I submit that the, the leader of this department would be Judge Napolitano. I was taking his class about the interface of the Constitution uh, with the market, primarily the Commerce Clause, and we read a 1942 case, Wickard v. Filburn, and the Commerce Clause says uh, the Constitution can regulate commerce between states. In this case, says this guy who is growing wheat above what's allowed by the government to feed his own uh, animals on his farm is in violation of the Commerce Clause because his behavior in aggregate, meaning if a lot of people did it, could affect interstate commerce. And I'm reading that saying, wow, this is crazy. And it was so refreshing to see Judge Napolitano essentially have the same sentiment, whereas I know back home or in any of my classes, uh, you know, I'd be hearing people say, well, uh, the Founding Fathers, uh, you know, if they were in 2022, they would have a completely different conception of the English language where 
the Constitution just doesn't mean what it says anymore. So I think it's just very refreshing to have common sense at the Mises University, Mises Institute, and that's what I remember most from my time there. Liam? So it was probably my first or second day at my first Mises U, and I was eating lunch, and this dude plops down, sits next to me, he's like, okay, covenant communities, good or bad? And I have a mouthful of chicken sandwich. I turn to my left, I'm like, what? And keep in mind, I'm from, I'm from Washington State, and that's not exactly the land of the libertarian, right? Like, there's maybe, there's maybe me and like five, five other guys out there, and that's, that's about it. So I turn to my left, I'm like, what? And he's like, covenant communities, good or bad? And I proceeded to have like a 45 minute conversation with this guy on covenant communities and you know, pri private association in like an anarcho-capitalist society. And you know, that's not something you have, I have in Washington unless I'm talking to someone online, right? Um, and the same day, uh, Dr. Salerno, uh, I was sitting next to him at lunch and I got to just you know, talk to him about football. And it seems like something simple, but you know, when it's someone that you have read their literature and looked up to and watched all their lectures for a long time, it truly does mean a lot. And there's no other place like Mises U where you can do things like this. So it is truly indispensable uh, and, and so, so, so valuable. It's not just a learning resource, but for great value socialization and uh, great discourse among other students. You know, there's, there's two parts to it, really. I think pretty much every conversation I had was unique to Mises U. I had conversations with people about subjects that I probably would never have brought up outside of the Mises Institute. And the responses I got in those conversations were uniquely reasonable and intelligent and respectful. I don't think I could pick like one, one moment that was most memorable. There were, there were so many conversations that I don't think I could ever have again. How about you, Connor? For me, when I think of any one conversation, I mean, like she said, there are so many, but I always think back to, uh, for those of you here, if you've met Anthony Cesario, he's one of our uh, students here as well. He looks like Rasputin, can't miss him. But uh, the number of nights that he, uh, all the other fellows, a bunch of the Mises U students, and it, even though has joined in a number of nights, just sitting around Rothbard Village till God knows four in the morning, arguing about, I mean, the ethics of hoarding in a desert island situation. <laughs> it's, it gets into any crazy little thing, but what's really, I think what draws all of us together is that, I mean, every conversation you have at Mises U is incredible because as great as it is being able to hear all these phenomenal lectures from these brilliant minds, what makes Mises U and all these Mises events so special is that a lecture you can get online, but when the lecture ends, you can walk up to the most brilliant Austrian minds in the entire world, pick their brain, learn more what they had to say, and once you've wrapped your head around it, go back, sit in a hotel lobby, sit in Rothbard Village, wherever it may be, and extrapolate it into concrete things, or abstract things, any number of different issues until, like I said, God knows four in the morning with students who are all also incredibly brilliant in their own right. So that's an important PSA for anyone listening to this later on YouTube or Odyssey. You know, you may be applying to Mises U in the future. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people here are, are concerned about the direction that younger generations are, are looking at. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your experiences at Mises U, having these unique conversations, how has it changed the way that you've discussed these sort of issues with people your own age? And does it, does it make you more optimistic? You know, do, you have, do you have success persuading people your own age, or does it make it feel a little bit more pessimistic about just kind of the large tide that we're kind of dealing with, with all the indoctrination out there? You can start that one off, Con. So I, it makes me incredibly more optimistic. Uh, as our Baylor professors, Dr. and Dr. Klein know, I am a diehard TCU Horned Frog fan, and we had a big win over Oklahoma last week, and after we won, our school was posting left and right why not us? Every time I'm interacting with Mises students, I feel that exact sensation of why not us? When I look at someone like Liam, who is 17 and has been to two Mises U's, I, I just look at that and I think, oh my God, why not us? Why can't this kid go out and make the world a better place, a more Austrian place? And every interaction I have after Mises U, I'm, I'm on fire and quite frankly, that fire catches on very fast. 
Annika? Same as you. I think more optimistic. I, I just still haven't mastered the art of convincing people of my generation of what I believe. But I, I think the more these ideas matter in young people's immediate life, the more they start to look for answers that make sense to all the problems they're seeing. And a lot of young people, I think, are moving towards Austrian ideas or ideas about liberty because they see that that's kind of the only thing that makes sense in the world. Liam? 49%. 49% is the number of people in Generation Z who associate most closely with socialism. Now, I'm gonna be honest, sometimes it's hard to be an optimist. I get it. I know a lot of you might feel the same. If you're passionate about the liberty movement, if you're passionate about Austrian economics and the ideas of Mises and Rothbard, sometimes it feels like we're fighting a losing battle. But as much as, it, as it's easy to give in and be a pessimist, it's also important to be an optimist. If we truly want our ideas to win, and if we want our ideas to, uh, to, to reach a peak and to, and to go above and beyond, we need to be optimists. And I know some of you might philosoph philosophically disagree with it, um, but in order to, to, to connect with this generation and to connect with those who oppose our ideals, um, it is important to do this. And that is why I feel as optimistic as, as, as I can truly can be uh, about Miesian ideas. And I think that you know, even though the circles I'm in, I'm, I'm 17 years old, right? It's, it's hard to convince people sometimes and it, it's hard to reach out to them. You know, uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's a very common thing to see them, see people post just blatantly, blatantly wrong things on social media. Like, and you ask them where, where, where they get this information and you get blocked. Um, and so, <laughs> It, it, it kind of happens like clockwork, like uh, the most simple questions, you know. So we have to remember, people are fragile, and if we want to win this fight, we have to be optimistic. We have to uh, you know how to connect people, uh, connect with people, and uh, you know, overall, I just I feel as optimistic as can be. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I'm not going to go against the grain here. I would say I'm broadly optimistic. I mean, sure, there's some people, you know, you can't convince. You probably can't convince the person who tells the Cuban immigrant, uh, actually, you're Latinx, not Latino. <laughs> but but uh, I think most people like our age, they may be apolitical, but when push comes to shove, the instinct for liberty kicks in. Now, that doesn't mean I think secretly at my school uh, everyone has a stashed away copy of Theory of Money and Credit, but it does mean that when my, for instance, my school imposes uh, mask mandates and social distancing and all kinds of things that are just anti-liberty, you know, the students that were apolitical uh, are suddenly saying, hey, maybe I, I, need to, I need to reconsider my stances or this is affecting me. I can't go to class normally. I can't interact with people unless they look like this, like have a mask over their face. Um, and just normal interactions are destroyed. And so I think the good news is because of uh, the crazy tyranny that we've experienced since 2020, the case for libertarianism and Misesian ideas has never been easier. And I think that extends to young people. And maybe it starts with, uh, instead of starting with Austrian business cycle theory, you start with, uh, hey, yeah, I mean, I don't think your fraternity or your classroom should uh, be completely handicapped from uh, allowing its members to behave like normal human beings. I've got one more question for all four of you. I want to start with, with you, Mitchell. Um, kind of building off that a little bit, um, you know, one of, uh, one of the things that uh, in your CV is that you're a writer for the Chicago Thinker, which has a few Mises U alums, I think, uh, within there already. Um, can you guys talk about how the, the lessons and kind of the ideas that you've engaged with at Mises U um, how you plan to, to bring them out into the real world, you know, e either right now in your work or in future endeavors. And I know you, you made, uh, and some of your colleagues made some headlines, uh, yeah, kind of taking a Rothbardian spirit to some of the fake news outlets out there. Can you touch, talk a little bit about that as well as anything um, more directly to Mises U? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
summer 2020, the Mises U I went to, I, there's one other kid who's a rising freshman at U Chicago. He's better dressed than I am, a man of much sophistication. His name's Declan Hurley, and we hit it off right away. And a couple months after Mises U, uh, we form a publication called The Chicago Thinker, which is a conservative and libertarian publication. And, and now fast forward two years later, uh, Declan's the editor-in-chief. I'm the associate publisher. And in that span, we've uh, gone after a school for nonsensical booster mandates, um, mask mandates, um, violations of, of their free speech policies, which is held historically in high regard at UChicago. Um, and we've done what was referred to um, when Joe Salerno quoted uh, Rothbard's strategy of kind of dynamism and extreme uh, excitement um, with respect to just kind of targeting specific people and saying, you're behaving in a ridiculous manner. We've Ann Applebaum of The Atlantic and Brian Stelter, I don't have to explain who that is, uh, came to our school and we just asked them very simple questions that, that you know, you would think with all of their uh, resumes the size of a CBS receipt, you'd think they'd be able to answer basic questions from college students, but they couldn't. And so I think our paper's goal, we want to be intellectual, um, but a lot of the theme of today has also been about being reactionary in the sense that we need to look at specific people and say, all right, we need to examine what you believe, what you're propagating, because um, it's, you're clearly a paper tiger. There's nothing behind you, and, and you're just propagandizing people. And so we've tried to do that and, and had, uh, thankfully, quite a bit of success so far. And, and uh, if you want to check us out, you can go to the chicagothinker.com or follow us on Twitter at ThinkerChicago. I run the social media, so I'd appreciate it. But yeah, so hopefully we're carrying on the legacy of Rothbard in that, in that avenue. You, Liam? Well, so like any other, you know, like any other university or, or any program, you, you're going to retain a lot of knowledge from Mises U. But the knowledge doesn't necessarily mean as much if you don't do anything with it, right? If I go to Mises U and then just, you know, don't do anything afterwards, I, I feel like I'm wasting a, a good means of advancing the movement uh, for the peaceful society that we, 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 we would like. I feel like I, I'm putting that to waste. So one thing I could say for myself and definitely for everyone else, even if you think it's garbage, even if you think you're not an intellectual thinker, write, 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 write. Write down any ideas that pop up in your head, write down things after you watch lectures, write down things that you think might be useful towards yourself or towards the Austrian or libertarian movement, write it down. Um, there's also so many different ways that you could use this information. Like if you have family members that are in interested in, in government or economics, introduce them to ec Austrian economics. That's definitely one of the main things I did, uh, especially after my first Mises U. I was talking to my uncle and my extended family, and I was talking to a bunch of my friends about Austrian economics. Um, even, even if it annoys them, talk to them about it, because one more person you know, helping the cause could mean the, could mean the entire difference. Like he said, um, just talking to people, using what I learned at Mises University to try to explain to people what I believe in, I think that's been and will continue to be the greatest gift I got from Mises University. I think I, I've, I wasn't very comfortable talking to people about things that I knew would probably be controversial. But after Mises University, I think I gained a lot of confidence in my ability to explain what I wanted to get across. And I also got a giant stack of books that I now have to back me up. That's helpful. Um, but yeah, I think mostly I'll use that, everything I learned, just to, to bring it to anyone that is willing to listen to me. You, Connor? 
So I am a middle and high school teacher, and I, for, for our high school economics class at the school I work, the honors students all have to do an independent book study. So I worked with the other economics teacher, and we have their independent book study being Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. We actually, back when the Institute was giving them out for free, we had a lot of them brought in, so the Institute actually supplied the kids with the books. And then on top of it, with my middle schoolers, I have a little economics club where we meet every Friday, and they all know the Bastiat quote about the seen and the unseen. Um, our school is called the Pine School, so we have a whole pine cone theme with Mark Spitznagel's book. And honest to God, this week before I came out here, I was sitting in my office, and a 10-year-old comes barging in my door. And he says, Mr. Mortel, I was reading during study hall, and I heard that the Fed is going to raise rates again. What does that mean? <laughs> so next week, I'm playing a game with my 10-year-olds where I'm going to give half of them a stack of blocks, and they're going to build a tower, and the other half a stack of blocks where they're going to build a tower. And whoever builds more gets the donuts. The catch they don't know is they're getting an artificial price signal, and I'm lying to one group about how many blocks they get. So they're going to learn real quick. And then next week, I'm actually taking my GRE to hopefully apply for my PhD in economics and take everything I've learned from the greatest organization on the entire planet as far as I possibly can. Yeah. And Connor, we only got a couple minutes left, so I got one last question for you. Since you do have a little bit of a different experience than others, you haven't been through RGS this year, haven't been to the fellowship, is there anything else in just the degree to which kind of these programs, I know you were able to spend time with some of the younger scholars doing research, anything else that people need to know about, again, the programs, the, the, the students that are coming through here, um, what's, what's the last sort of uh, moment you'd, you'd share with the audience here? Oh, God, everything. It's, I got to be there this whole summer. I had the blessing of being President Dice's intern this summer. And I went through RGS, and then I spent time with all the fellows. Every fellow we have is brilliant. I encourage every person here, like I said, go talk to Anthony about the fellowship to see the work he did and the work he put out. At RGS, you see the incredible engagement you get from 20 different grad students working through. This year, it was... Uh, Rothbard's power and market, you can feel the weight of the history that is it. You can feel the 40 years of history that are at the Mises Institute at any given event we have, but especially when you're physically there on the campus and when you're seeing the unbelievably incredible work that these students are putting out. It is beyond real, and I just, I am so proud to be a part of it. Again, none of this is possible without our donors. Thank you guys so much for supporting the Mises Institute, for supporting students that we have up here. <laughs> And um, thanks for being a part of this. Okay.